microbiology study guide for our next midterm. And um, so there will be uh, two parts to this presentation. And on part one, which is this first part, there's two parts. And on part one, we are going to be uh, covering the subject of the control of bacterial growth and antibiotics. <clears throat> so let's start off with antimicrobial agents. So um, of course there is a, um, I really should have said multi-billion dollar industry that it has been created around these antimicrobial agents. Um, so um, the idea is to keep antimicrobial from invading our homes and invading our bodies. Um, so anytime you walk down um, certain aisles of our local uh, grocery markets, um, you will get bombarded with products um, that have labels that include key terms such as uh, sanitizers or disinfectants or antibacterial. And we might wonder what the differences between these terms are, or um, we might have an idea of what they mean, but not exactly know the specifics. So let's really understand what these terms actually mean. <clears throat> so um, you might be disappointed, but when it comes to the word sanitation, it's not as sanitary as you might have thought. So sanitation just means a reduction in the microbial population to a point at which um, is considered safe by the Food and Drug Administration. And um, what is deemed safe um, can change over time. And I kind of like this little joke here with, um, um, don't worry, Salmonellos will not be found in your local grocery store. Um, it's a little joke here, but <clears throat> the FDA is the one that um, sets regulations for what is considered um, an acceptable amount of feces or bug parts or um, fly eggs or larva that might be found in different products that you purchase. Um, uh, rodent hair, for example. So a um, little disturbing, but nonetheless, that's what it is. So um, this is kind of fun. So I actually went to the website and you can go to www.fda.gov and actually look at some of the allowances of uh, different contaminants that are allowed in your favorite products that you purchase. So um, a little bit disturbing. So um, one of my favorite products is peanut butter and maybe not so much anymore, but um, so from the FDA website, your peanut butter has an average of 30 or more insect fragments per 100 grams, or an average of one or more rodent hairs per 100 grams. So yeah, that's, yeah. If you ever want a good read, um, go ahead and go to the website. It's kind of fun, so, <clears throat> all right. Um, so another term that uh, you've probably heard of is sterilization. When we talk about sterilization, this is actually the complete, 100% complete destruction of any and all living organisms, all microorganisms. So, um, so therefore you could say that you have sterilized an object or you have sterilized a countertop or a medical instrument but it would be inappropriate to say that you have sterilized a, uh, a living tissue. So you would not be able to say that you have sterilized a person's wound, for example, because obviously there is still living tissue on the person. So, <clears throat> um, so disinfection, uh, disinfectants, we find them all over the place. So when we talk about disinfection, uh, disinfection refers to the destruction of pathogens, and pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease. Um, and uh, you can disinfect living or non-living sur surfaces. So basically a disinfectant is just something that is going to destroy uh, disease-causing microorganisms, otherwise known as pathogens. Okay, 
Um, so next we'll talk about uh, disinfectants and antiseptics. So uh, disinfectants, <clears throat> disinfectants are used on non-living surfaces and um, disinfectants are antimicrobial agents that are used on a non-living surface or an object. Whereas an, anti, uh, an antiseptic is used to disinfect living surfaces. So an antiseptic are used outside of the body, so on the body's surface. Okay, so what is the point of this? Why do we why do we make such a big deal? Why is there so much money being uh, being spent by consumers um, to purchase all of these products? Well, in short, um, we must control the growth of microorganisms to prevent pathogens from reaching our bodies. So how do we do this? Um, there are methods of controlling microbial growth. Um, there are a lot of different methods. Um, this would be an extremely long presentation if I went through them all. So we're just going to um, just choose just a few to discuss. <clears throat> now, the methods of controlling the growth of microorganisms um, are grouped together basically into two broad categories. Um, the first category would be physical methods, and the second would be chemical methods. So um, the first method is to use extreme temperatures. So basically um, um, taking that microbe into um, temperatures that would be much hotter than it would normally uh, like to be in, or much, much colder than it would normally like to be in so <clears throat> all right so how does temperature affect microbial growth well microbes are fungi and uh, bacterial cells for example when we're talking about those types of pathogens those are cells and they're metabolically active well we know that um, all of the different steps of metabolism, they're going to require enzymes, and enzymes are proteins. And enzymes um, are all going to have a temperature that they function best at. Um, so here, for example, I've got um, a graph of an enzyme that works best at body temperature, which is around 37 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> so, and this, uh, this preferential temperature is going to vary depending on the enzyme, and it will also dep um, depend on the microbe that we're talking about. Now, with the, with the individual microbes, if we take the temperature high enough <clears throat> for the enzymes that are inside that particular microbe, we can destroy the activity of the enzymes within that microbe if we can get the temperature hot enough to denature these enzymes. So what happens when we denature enzymes is we're actually destroying the tertiary structure of the enzyme. So this renders that enzyme completely dysfunctional and it does not come back from this state. So it essentially destroys the function of the enzyme permanently. So it is destroyed. <clears throat> okay, now when we go the other way, so if we look at an enzyme that is at its optimal temperature and then slowly start to uh, decrease the temperature, what occurs there is the, um, the enzyme is still intact, its tertiary structure is still intact, but um, the activity of that enzyme is going to decrease, meaning that it's going to slow down. So whatever processes that enzyme is involved in is going to proceed much more slowly than it normally would. And this trend is going, to, um, is going to continue, and the colder that it gets, the, um, the more that activity of the enzyme will decrease. 
and we can get to a point where we can essentially stop the um, activity um, of that enzyme. So it's basically completely halted. However, we can um, then thaw that enzyme or that microbe and um, when that comes back to its favorable temperature, then that, um, that tertiary structure is still intact and it can go ahead and regain its function. Um, this is why you can have something in the refrigerator and then take it out of the refrigerator and it will go ahead and spoil very quickly again. Or you can have something in the freezer for a while and it's prevented from spoiling, but if you take it out of the freezer, allow it to thaw, and then have it sit on the counter for a couple of days, it will go ahead and spoil. So, um, And we also have instances where we have found microbes that have uh, lying, been lying dormant in ice sheets uh, found in Antarctica or have been um, buried in, um, uh, have been found inside of glaciers. And some of these microbes are estimated to have been there for hundreds or even thousands of years. And once they thaw, they actually uh, become metabolically active again and begin to resume their life processes. So it's pretty Pretty interesting. However, when we heat them, this does not happen. So if we can heat that microbe hot enough, we will essentially destroy the microbe permanently. So of course, um, um, thermophilic bacteria will be just fine. Um, also, if, if it is the type of bacteria that um, are able to develop spores, and if they are hibernating in that uh, spore state, then that's the boiling's not going to be able to kill those bacteria either. Um, but if you're in a pinch, you know, boiling will take care of a lot of, a lot of bacteria. So, um, but it's, it's not a perfect system. So this will not sterilize, uh, many, uh, many things. So, <clears throat> um, a better method is autoclaving. Autoclaving is really an industry standard. This is what you will see in doctor's offices and hospitals, dentist offices. So this is where you will have, um, uh, dental instruments, surgical instruments. This is where they will be, uh, where they will be sterilized. Um, so the autoclaves are able to achieve much higher temperatures than boiling water by using, uh, basically using a trick of uh, pressure. So adding pressure to that, so allowing uh, moist temperatures to achieve um, higher temperatures than uh, boiling water. <clears throat> okay. So it uses moist heat, which causes uh, protein denaturing, which you know is, that's what we want because it's a good thing. And the um, and spores are killed with um, autoclave exposure. So this is this is a great uh, a great method. Um, there there are also ovens which are a dry heat, but um, they really can't compare to the autoclaves. So autoclaves are really the best way to go. Just so you can compare and contrast uh, the spores, for example, of a bacterium. Um, are eliminated um, using only 15 minutes in a moist autoclave versus um, it would actually take two hours in a dry heat oven in, at 160 degrees Celsius to kill spores of a bacterium in a dry heat oven. So um, pretty big difference there. <clears throat> okay, so what happens if we go the other way? So if we start getting colder and colder, so let's take the, let's go ahead and take the microbe and we'll start getting it colder and colder. So, and, um, and this is why we refrigerate food as well. Okay. So, um, so it doesn't spoil or it doesn't spoil at least as quickly, hopefully. Right. <laughs> so, um, what that does is that's going to slow down microbial growth. 
but of course it does not kill microbes. If it did, then we could just go ahead and keep our food in the refrigerator forever and it would not spoil. But of course that doesn't happen. So, so it slows down microbial growth, but it does not kill the microbes. Now, if we freeze, um, even in the freezer, it still will slow it down, but it still will um, still will tend to spoil given enough time. We have deep freezers though that are like negative 80, or we can use you know liquid nitrogen, which gets much much colder. So um, we can essentially get cold enough that we're effectively halting the uh, putrefication process and we are um, pretty much halting the uh, microbial growth. So however, you are not denaturing the, um, you're not denaturing the enzymes, you're not denaturing the proteins, and you will be able to recover microbial growth upon thawing. <clears throat> okay. Um, so common laboratory practice is to use uh, liquid nitrogen. Um, I do this in my lab uh, to preserve cells and tissues. And um, so liquid nitrogen is between, you know, negative uh, 210 degrees Celsius and, you know, like 196 degrees Celsius. So, so at that temperature, you can really keep um, tissues for a very extended period of time for, you know, years and years. And, and they're, they're pretty safe at that. Another way of preservation. So, um, and this is really the, the reason why, um, uh, people developed dehydration um, was because we didn't used to have things like ice available and refrigeration and freezers. So um, the way that uh, people would be able to have fruits during off seasons was to preserve them. And one of the ways to that, um, that people would preserve the fruits is by dehydrating the fruits like you see here. So, um, and they would do the same thing with like beef jerky, for example, it was a way of preserving it so that they could, you know, have it, have it on hand, you know, plus, um, so it, it would last much longer and you would be able to keep it around. So how this works is you're basically taking the water out of the environment. <clears throat> so, um, if you take water out of the environment, then you're halting the microbial growth. Okay. Now, if I added the water back in, then the microbes are going to be able to start growing again. <clears throat> so how is this done? So you could do this by sun drying. This is how dried fruits are are uh, preserved. This is how beef jerky is made. Um, another way you could do this is by salting the heck out of it <laughs> or adding a ton of sugar to something. Um, and, and the way that, that the addition of salt or the addition of sugar will, um, will do that. So the way that the addition of uh, salt and a ton of sugar will, will um, work by drying out the water is um, actually through the process of osmosis. So there are um, more particles that are outside of the fruit or the beef than inside. So that draws the water from inside of the fruit or beef to the outside. Okay. So these foods are not considered sterile, but they are considered preserved. <clears throat> There are also chemical methods of controlling bacterial growth, and we will look at just a few of them. Um, you may have seen these contraptions available at, um, at your local stores or your pharmacy. Uh, UV light, and it actually does work. So um, UV light is a form of ionizing radiation. And ionizing radiation works by forming free radicals. And free radicals are going to damage uh, microbial DNA and proteins. And um, however, if the microbe is in um, the form of a spore, 
then it may be protected from uh, the UV radiation. But uh, typically this is, uh, this is very good. Um, alcohol is very, very common. <clears throat> as long as it's 70% or more concentrated, then this is really good. And the way that, that these alcohols work is they are going to denature proteins and they also work to dissolve the lipid membrane of the microbes. So that, that's good. Also detergents. Detergents also work in a similar manner um, when we talk about um, uh, deteriorating the integrity of the membrane of the microorganisms. So detergents, um, by definition, what a detergent does is it actually is going to um, insert, um, insert Detergents actually work by disrupting the lipid bilayer of membranes, um, and they do this by solubilizing the membrane proteins by partitioning into the membrane bilayer itself. Um, this is going to cause the cytoplasm of the microorganism to leak out, and eventually death will follow. Um, other chemicals that you may, heard, may have heard of that will also um, control growth of a microorganism is uh, formalin uh, or formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde. They're all um, very similar compounds, um, but they're toxic, carcinogenic. Um, um, they're, but they are good as, um, as um, their antimicrobial quantities. And they're commonly used for tissue preservation um, in laboratories, but of course they have to be handled with care. Um, halogens, now these are would include like iodines and chlorine, including bleach. Um, they're very common. And your, your hydrogen peroxide, for example. So, and the way that the peroxides will work is they release free oxygen and uh, free oxygen is going to wreak havoc among the cells. It actually, um, the, the, it actually the, the free oxygen is a singlet oxygen and it kind of acts a little bit like a free radical. Um, you can think of it as that free oxygen is going to just go around and uh, cause a lot of unwanted chemical reactions within the cell. So, and, and, those unwanted chemical reactions are going to lead to death of that microorganism. Also, organic matter will interfere with um, antimicrobial agents. So if you have a contamination of the area that you're trying to treat, then that creates a physical barrier of protection. Um, and the way that that works is um, that presence of the organic matter, uh, this could be blood, it could be feces or urine, um, what occurs is that organic substance can be reacting with the antimicrobial agent so that none of the agent is available um, to kill the unwanted microorganism. So basically, it's already been sequestered by um, all of the other um, all of the other organic material that it has had to deal with. Um, also, just the physical barrier as well. So just the physical coating of the microorganism, which uh, provides a protective barrier between the microbe and the antimicrobial agent that's trying to get there. So um, next we'll just uh, talk a little bit about antibiotics. And um, interestingly, um, they, were, they were discovered sort of by accident by a bacteriologist in 1928 by the name of Alexander Fleming. And, um, and what he and what he was doing 
is um, he was studying bacteria like a good bacteriologist should do. And he was using Petri dishes. And um, so if you could just imagine that, you know, there's a bunch of Petri dishes that are piled high in a sink. And these Petri dishes are, um, have been, uh, um, have been smeared with, with bacteria and allowed to grow. Um, now the sink was full of water and the sink had um, had some Lysol disinfectant in the water. But the dishes were piled pretty high. So some of the Petri dishes that were lying near the top or towards the top of the pile did not get exposed to the disinfectant. So, <clears throat> So Alexander was a bad boy, did not do the dishes, and left for vacation for a few days. But when he came back, he noticed something interesting. When he returned from vacation, he noticed that on the Petri dishes that did not get exposed to the Lysol, so they did not get exposed to the, um, the disinfectant, <clears throat> those petri dishes grew mold and he noticed that the petri dishes that grew mold actually um, that the mold actually killed the bacteria okay so um, here's an example so the plates were streaked with bacteria like shown here and after the few days of incubation, the mold grew, like shown here, and he saw this evidence that the mold had killed the bacteria. And we see this ring here where the bacteria was killed by the mold. And this was an observation that had not been made before. So this mold, this mold is a, is a fungus, and um, this is the fungus uh, penicillium, and this was the first discovered antibiotic. So Alexander Fleming soon identified the mold that he was looking at was the fungus penicillium, which was later made available to the, well, to the public with you know, with a prescription by a doctor, of course, which was later made available in the form of penicillin for medical use. And this was a, this is just a huge, um, really changed the face of medicine permanently, permanently. So, <clears throat> so antibiotics take charge. Since the discovery of penicillin, many more antibiotics have been discovered and manufactured. Um, these have a wide range of bacterial targets and are able to combat bacterial growth through different means or mechanisms of action. So what are antibiotics? Well, simply, antibiotics are simply defined as any drug that either kills or inhibits the growth of one or more species of bacteria. So they don't have to actually kill the bacteria. They could just inhibit or even just greatly slow the growth of bacteria. Okay. So um, it's important though, it's very important for an antibiotic or any antimicrobial drug to have what's called selective toxicity. Okay. So selective toxicity um, means that, that you've you find something that is going to um, kill the microbe without killing the host. In other words, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I don't know if you've ever heard that saying, but um, there's an old saying, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, which means that you don't want to get rid of what you don't want. Well, sorry, <laughs> that you want to get rid of what you don't want, but you want to keep what you do want. Okay, so you want to get rid of the pathogen, but you want to keep the host alive. So, 
So the way to achieve this selective toxicity is to ensure that the target of the drug is only found in the organism that you want to kill and that the target is not in the host. So let's look at these targets. So a target is something that the antibiotic or antimicrobial will disrupt or destroy in order to kill or inhibit the growth of the unwanted microbe. Now, when we talk about bacteria, targets are plentiful. So this is a good thing. Now, the reason why this is uh, the reason why there are so many targets in bacteria cells is because humans have eukaryotic cells, and bacteria are prokaryotic, and there are a lot of differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So what that means is there are a ton of different mechanisms and a lot of different targets that um, antibiotics can use to, um, to kill bacteria. So that's a good thing. Now, when it comes to pathogens that are, um, that are viruses, or I'm sorry, or that are viruses or fungi or parasites like protozoa, um, that is much more difficult. Um, and the reason is because there are fewer unique, and when I say unique, that means there are fewer things that they have that we do not have. So you have to find something that is in them that the human does not have. So between us and bacteria, easy. That's an easy task. Between us and viruses, it's actually tough because viruses are very simple. They've got a protein coat. They have a little bit of genetic material. There's not much there. We have all those things. So very difficult to find a target there. Um, fungi, protozoa, well, they're eukaryotic cells, and so are we. So really difficult to find a unique target. So that's why that we have so many um, antibiotics, but far less drugs available for um, antifungal medications and um, antiparasitic medications and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so um, when it comes to antibiotics and the mechanisms of actions, otherwise known as the mode of actions, what that means is that's just basically talking about how the antibiotic will work. How does it function? How does it kill the bacteria? Or how does it inhibit the growth of the bacteria? So there are five basic mechanisms of action that antibiotics use. Okay. So we have uh, inhibition of protein synthesis. We have inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis, inhibition of cell wall synthesis, disruption of cell membrane function, blockage of the pathways, um, and inhibition of metabolism. So, um, so there are, and I've already alluded to it, but let's um, go ahead and formalize it with some terminology. <clears throat> so I mentioned that antibiotics can either kill or they can um, stop or even just greatly slow down the growth of the bacteria. So each one of those actually has uh, terminology associated with it. So um, antibiotics that function to destroy or kill bacteria are called bactericidal antibiotics. And antibiotics that function to stop or slow the growth of bacteria are bacteriostatic antibiotics. You may have also heard of narrow-spectrum antibiotics and broad-spectrum antibiotics. 
And the differences here basically just means that um, narrow, spe narrow spectrum antibiotics are going to work on fewer, on a, a more narrow range of microorganisms um, than broad spectrum antibiotics, which are going to work on a much larger range of microorganisms. And here's a chart here to just kind of give you a visual of uh, what they mean by narrow spectrum versus broad spectrum. So a lot of times if they're not sure about the microorganism that is uh, causing the symptoms and signs that a patient is experiencing, sometimes they'll put the patient on a broad spectrum antibiotic. So an example of an antibiotic that uses the mechanism of inhibition of cell wall synthesis is penicillin. So penicillin works by, um, by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. Um, so penicillin works on gram-positive bacteria, and the uh, penicillin works by preventing the formation of the peptidoglycans which form the cell wall of the gram-positive bacteria, which hopefully you, um, hopefully you remember that. So without peptidoglycan, the cell wall cannot form. So this causes the uh, bacteria to swell, which causes it to burst or lice. And of course, that means death to the cell. So gram-negative bacteria have this outer membrane that uh, prevents larger molecules like penicillin from entering the cell. Okay, so with uh, gram-negative bacteria, penicillin would not be a good antibiotic to choose. Antibiotic resistance. So um, there's always a constant war going on in the microorganism world. Bacteria cells have been known to chemically alter proteins that antibiotics recognize. So some bacteria cells contain the enzyme beta-lactamase, which hydrolyzes the antibiotic, rendering it useless. So there's all this chemical warfare going on in our bodies that we're not even aware of. Okay, so here is the uh, part two of the microbiology study guide. And here we're going to cover the subjects of epidemiology and pathogenicity. So epidemiology is um, focused on understanding the origin, mechanism, and spread of disease for the purposes of preventing and mitigating suffering. So a lot of different things cause disease. Um, just some examples would be genetics, toxins, chemicals, and of course, microorganisms. And the microorganisms that cause disease are bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and fungi. Um, however, not all bacteria are bad, and not all viruses are harmful, not all protozoa are parasites, and not all fungi are infectious. So we want to be fair. So when attempting to understand and diagnose disease, the first order of business is to be able to identify the types of bacteria that are considered the normal flora of the body and to understand the locations in which these normal flora of the body are typically found. So the normal flora um, consists of all the many different types and kinds of microbes that inhabit the body. So normal flora are going to inhabit our skin, nose, eyes, mouth, throat, the GI tract, respiratory tract, 
um, and the reproductive tract. And you can look at these slides on your own if you're interested in um, some of the colonizing bacteria. It's actually quite a few, as you can see. <laughs> More than you, you might have known. <clears throat> However, other areas of our body should not contain flora. For example, anatomical sites in the body, including your organs, should not contain flora. Blood should not contain flora. Your urine should not. Your lymphatic fluid, your cerebral spinal fluid, none of those areas should contain any microorganisms. <clears throat> now, the colonization of our body by normal flora that are in the usual areas they inhabit is not considered an infection. However, if bacteria that are considered normal flora in one area of the body cross over to colonize one of these areas of the body that should not have organ, uh, microorganisms in it, um, in this case, this would be an infection. Also, of course, um, infections occur when exogenous or bacteria that are outside of the body infect us. All right, so some terminology. So a pathogen is defined as a microorganism that causes disease. Pathogenicity is that ability of that microorganism to cause the disease in the host. And the virulence of that uh, pathogen is the degree to which that pathogen is able to, um, to display the symptoms of disease in the host. So an example of a uh, natural flora that we have on our skin is Staphylococcus aureus. So, um, so about 40% of the time we've got Staphylococcus aureus that exists on our skin and has colonized us and calls us home. And it's okay, don't be too creeped out. It doesn't cause us harm as long as it stays put on our skin. Um, however, if we have this on our skin and we cut ourselves open, um, this uh, Staphylococcus aureus, aureus can go ahead and penetrate the deeper layers of the skin and may end up entering the bloodstream. Now, once, once that uh, flora has crossed over into the bloodstream at that point, it is called an infection. So let's now discuss infections and infectious disease. So an infection is defined as the presence of a microorganism that is in a part of the body where it is not normally found. So an infectious disease is defined as an infection that causes harm to the host. Okay. We have chronic diseases and we have acute diseases. Okay, so I had a little bit of fun here. This is my chronic disease, my disease causing virus and my acute because she's cute, disease causing virus. So, <clears throat> so chronic diseases are long lasting, uh, typically years or even lifelong, um, or they are constantly reoccurring, whereas acute diseases have a sudden onset, rapid progression, short duration, and usually they are in need of urgent care. So pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease, for example. Uh, so one Staph aureus for short, or of course Staphylococcus aureus, enters the bloodstream, it is pathogenic, meaning it causes harm to the host. It can, in, it can then invade internal organs, causing even more harm to the host. It can actually lead to a condition caused, uh, called toxic shock syndrome, which can even lead to death. Pathogenicity is the property of the microorganism to cause the infection in the host. So the pathogenicity is going to vary with a microbe's ability to invade or harm host tissues, 
with a condition of the host, I'm sorry, um, to invade or harm the host tissues with the condition of host defenses. Okay, so pathogenicity versus virulence. So virulence refers to the precise mechanisms used by the pathogen to invade and damage host tissues. So in other words, virulence is the degree of pathogenicity. So LD50 would be a good way to measure virulence. So LD50 is the number of pathogens needed to kill 50% of a population in a given period of time. So LD50 uh, would be determined either experimentally or by gathering epidemiological data. Um, and a way to look at pathogenicity would be to look at what's called infectious dose or ID50. Um, so in order for a host to become diseased, um, a large number of pathogenic microorganisms must invade the host or infect the host. So um, depending on how many microbes are needed, this is going to look at, you know, how, how pathogenic that particular uh, pathogen is. So we also have some terminology of different types of infection based on where they're located in the body or how they're localized. So with a systemic infection, we have microbes that are spread throughout the body using the circulatory system versus a localized infection, which is going to remain in one area or an isolated site. Um, we also have infections that happen in sequences. So if you have more than one site of infection, um, you'll have a primary infection and a primary infection will end up causing at a later time a secondary infection. For example, um, the HPV virus can lead later on to uh, cancer. We have HIV, which later on will lead to the secondary infection of AIDS, and there are a multitude of other examples of that. So that would be primary and secondary infections. So understanding how infections and pathogens, um, sorry, understanding how infectious pathogens spread is critical to preventing infectious diseases. Uh, some pathogens only survive inside a living host. Um, some pathogens can survive in a dormant state outside of a host. Some can be okay outside of a host for uh, decades or even hundreds of years. Um, so all pathogens have a mechanism of transfer from one host to another. Um, if they did not have a mechanism of transfer, then they would die when the host dies. So I just have a little example here with my little influenza virus, my little green dots here. Um, so this is a, just a little illustration of the influenza virus being transferred through a contaminated object. Just to freak you out. <clears throat> okay. So just an idea of the chain of infection, starting with the mode of transmission. So um, got the mode of transmission and then a portal of entry to get you know, inside of a host. And then you have the susceptible host, an infectious agent, um, a reservoir, and then a portal of exit. So, um, and here's another way to go ahead and look at the chain of infection. So you first have to have access to a host. So access to the host is achieved by the pathogen getting through the host's defenses. And if that is achieved, the pathogen can enter the sterile environment of the host through what is called a portal of entry. After that, after the the pathogen enters um, the portal of entry, it will enter the target tissue of the host. Um, so um, for example, this might be a particular organ 
or a particular tissue or the bloodstream or you know it depends on the type of pathogen so the pathogen causes damage now in the target tissue leading to the disease itself and the host experiences the uh, symptoms of that disease after a while a pathogen will leave the host through the portal of exit and uh, and attempt to find a new host okay so when we talk about a reservoir uh, the reservoir is a place where the pathogen ultimately originated or its long-term habitat um, whereas the source of infection refers to the immediate origin of an infectious agent. A carrier would be referred to as an individual that harbors the pathogen and spreads it to others. So let's, um, let's look at these terms in a little bit more detail. So a reservoir is defined as any place, and this could be a, a place within a living entity, or this could be a non-living environment um, that allows for microbial growth and shelter for a relatively long period of time. Examples could be soil, it could be water, it could be feces, or it could be a microorganism that is, um, that is surviving inside of a host where it's lying in kind of a dormant state where it's um, able to keep that host alive um, uh, for an extended period of time and we see that happen as well <clears throat> for human pathogens um, the most common reservoirs are animals other humans and the environment Carriers. So um, a carrier is defined as an individual that is capable of transmitting a pathogen without displaying symptoms. So, and there are two types of carriers. They could be passive or active. A passive carrier is contaminated with the pathogen and can mechanically transmit it to another host. However, a passive carrier is by definition not infected. Now, an active carrier is an infected individual who can transmit the disease to others. Um, an active carrier does not necessarily have to display any signs or symptoms of the infection, but they are indeed infected. So that's the difference between a passive an active carrier. Um, when looking at modes of transmission, um, it's important to understand the, the chain of infection, especially when we're talking about epidemiology and trying to uh, stop the spread of disease. So um, looking at that first, we have to kind of decide how things are spreading. So an infectious disease is a disease that can be spread either directly or indirectly from one person to another. Okay. This may be by direct contact. Um, this could be casual contact, um, like somebody sneezing on you here, or um, uh, intimate contact or sexual contact, uh, intravenous needles, blood transfusion, um, or indirect contact. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, we have what's called direct transmission infections. So these would be uh, um, infectious diseases that are transmitted by direct contact. Examples would be your um, your STDs or your sexually transmitted diseases. Examples of indirect transmissions um, would be um, diseases that are spread through vectors or fomites or vehicles. So vectors are usually your blood sucking insects that carry pathogens from one human to the next or from one animal to a human. Fomites are objects or materials that are commonly known to carry infection towels, clothes, utensils, furniture, etc. 
um, vehicles um, that can often carry infection, such as food, water, soil, um, playground equipment. <laughs> um, so some more terminology. Um, communicable infectious diseases. When we hear that word, that simply just means that this occurs when a pathogen is transmitted from a host to a host, either directly or indirectly, versus contagious diseases. Now, contagious diseases is a little bit more narrow than communicable infections. A contagious disease actually means that it is readily transmissible, uh, transmissible, but only through direct contact. Now, there are also non-infectious diseases. Now, non-infectious diseases are not contagious. So these diseases are not caused by pathogens. Instead, they're likely to have causes such as cancer, diabetes, genetic diseases, autoimmune diseases, and there are many more not listed here. Uh, the picture shown here is of a lovely young lady that has trisomy 21, which is a chromosomal abnormality, um, otherwise commonly known as Down syndrome, which is a genetic disease and, of course, is non-infectious and not contagious. So another part, um, another pathway of transmission is from animals to humans. These are called zoonotic diseases. So zoonotic diseases are infectious diseases of animals that can be transmitted from animals to humans. Probably the most commonly thought of one is rabies, but there is also anthrax, Lyme disease, and trichinosis. So zoonotic diseases um, like rabies, <clears throat> so this is actually the rabies virus. Um, so you can contract rabies by being bitten by an infected animal. Uh, rabies is a virus, a viral disease that causes inflammation of the brain in humans as well as other mammals. Early symptoms include fever and tingling at the site of exposure. Saliva from an infected animal is also able to transmit the disease if it comes in contact with the eyes, mouth, or nose. Unfortunately, the prognosis is usually death. Um, another zoonotic disease is actually anthrax. Um, it's contracted by handling or consuming anthrax-infected animals. Anthrax is found in hoofed uh, hoofed animals such as cows, sheep, and goats. So people who handle large amount of livestock in areas where infections are common, luckily it's not found here uh, in California, um, but uh, people that are at, at high risk, luckily there is a vaccine and vaccines are made available for people that are at high risk. However, anthrax is um, much more well known for, um, the, for its uh, weaponization, unfortunately. So anthrax has been weaponized by many, many, many countries um, as far back as the 1930s and probably even further back than that. So um, there's been reports of even um, uh, the effects of anthrax being tested on prisoners of war. And anthrax is a favorite because of the, mo the mode of infection is very convenient because it can, um, it can infect a host by inhalation, skin contact, or ingestion. So um, that's why it's kind of a, a, a weapon of choice, for lack of a better word. Okay, Lyme disease. Now, Lyme disease is um, is pretty scary because it is something that can happen here. <laughs> so, um, Lyme disease um, occurs if you get bitten by an infected tick. Um, it's caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. I'm probably mispronouncing that, and please forgive me. Um, <laughs> but this is uh, primarily transmitted by the 
Eoxes, I'm probably mispronouncing that too, um, also known as deer ticks, I can pronounce that one though, or black legged ticks, <laughs> um, but um, doxycycline, amoxicillin, um, antibiotics are able to cure that, so which is nice. <clears throat> so early signs and symptoms of Lyme disease, uh, one of them is called um, erythema erith migrans, which is this unique ringed type rash that you see here in the picture. So it's a type of rash that's associated with Lyme disease that typically doesn't itch, usually is not painful, but it does appear red and it tends to grow in size. Um, the, um, the victims of these diseases usually will get flu-like symptoms with fever, headache, and fatigue. If left untreated after time, um, um, these patients will experience joint pain and heart palpitations and even paralysis to portions of the face, fatigue, and even memory problems, which may even persist up to six months after treatment. Trichinosis. So trichinosis can be consumed by, um, sorry, can be contracted by consuming undercooked pork um, by a, a trichinella, by a trichinella, oh God, I can't speak. <laughs> Trichinosis can be contracted by consuming undercooked pork from a pig that has trichinella spiralis. So trichinosis is caused by an infection by the parasitic worm trichinella spiralis, which you can see here. Another way that diseases can be acquired is through vectors. So vectors are living organisms that can transmit infectious diseases either from one human to another human or from an animal to a human. And um, these are usually your blood sucking insects like this cute one here. Um, the process of infection involving blood sucking insects is as follows. So basically um, the blood sucking insect is going to ingest the pathogen during a blood meal from an infected host. And that host could be either a human or an animal. And then that blood sucking insect will go to a new host and have another meal from the new host and during that process will infect the new host with the pathogen. An example of a vector-borne disease is malaria. So mosquitoes can carry the pathogenic protozoa plasmodium. When an infected mosquito bites a human, the plasmodium can be transferred to the human host. In order to gain access to the host, the most common portal of entry is the mucous membranes. So usually we see the pathways to the respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, urinary and genital tracts, or the conjunctiva of the eye. Also, we see that the skin is a portal of entry as well but only through open wounds, hair follicles, or sweat glands, because very few microbes are able to colonize the surface of the skin. Skin is usually an impermeable barrier for microorganisms. Also, uh, pathogens can gain entry to the host through what's called the parenteral roots. Um, in other words, through um, penetration of the skin and penetration could be through uh, punctures, injections, bites, cuts, or surgery, etc. So when a patho pathogen enters a host through these uh, parenteral roots, um, 
this is really bad because typically that pathogen is going to get very deep into the tissues. Adherence. So adherence is the attachment of the microbe to the host at the portal of entry. So mechanisms of adhesion, um, one example, the pathogen can have surface adhesion molecules. And these are actually lig ligands which bind in a lock and key manner with receptors that are on the surface of the host cell. This binding allows the pathogenic microbe to have entrance to the cell. Three examples of mechanisms that pathogens use to evade or penetrate host cell defenses are capsules, antigen variation, and M proteins. The cell capsule is a very large structure of some prokaryotic cells, such as bacterial cells. It's a polysaccharide layer that lies outside the cell envelope of bacteria, and it's deemed part of the outer envelope of the bacterial cell. Um, the capsule effectively evades the host immune system by impairing phagocytosis. And, um, it prevents the engulfment and destruction by the leukocytes or white blood cells. Another strategy is uh, antigenic variation. So um, what it does here is the pathogen can actually alter its surface antigens so that the immune system cannot recognize it. And if it can't recognize it, it won't attack it. So pretty ingenious. Um, and then the last way, last uh, strategy we'll talk about is um, um, components of the cell wall. So Streptococcus pi pyogenes has an ingenious way <laughs> of uh, evading the host's immune system. And it uses its cell wall component um, that is called M protein. It is heat and acid resistant. It mediates at the attachment of bacterium to epithelial cells and it resists uh, phagocytosis by leukocytes. So pretty cool mechanism. Once the microbe has invaded the tissue, the result is damage to the tissues through a variety of different mechanisms. Um, so, and we have direct damage to host cells. Uh, when a pathogen grows inside of host cells, the host cells undergo lysis. When the pathogens are penetrating through the host tissues, the cells of that tissue are damaged and die, like shown here. Virulence factors are chemicals that are secreted by the pathogen, and they function to evade the host's immune system or cause harm to host tissues, or both. Virulence factors fall into two main categories, exoenzymes and toxins. An exoenzyme is also known as an extracellular enzyme. It's an enzyme that is secreted by a cell that functions outside of that cell. Exoenzymes of pathogens function to digest epithelial tissues, disrupt tissues, and allow pathogen invasion. For example, hyaluronidase is an exoenzyme that hydrolyzes or breaks down connective tissue and epithelial tissue to allow the pathogen to invade deeper into the tissues. Exotoxins. Membrane disrupting toxins cause lysis of the host cell by disrupting the plasma membrane. Leukocytins 
poke holes in the membranes of phagocytes. Leukocytins poke holes in membranes of phagocytic leukocytes. Hemolysins poke holes in membranes of red blood cells. Superantigens. Superantigens are proteins released from pathogenic bacteria that cause nonspecific immune responses in the host. This causes release of cytokines, which can cause fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, shock, and death. Example, toxic shock syndrome is caused by staphylococcus. Stages of infection or disease. First, we have the incubation period. This is the period that goes from initial contact with the infectious agent, and it ends with the appearance of the very first signs of symptoms. The prodromium period is the short period of initial vague symptoms. For example, our girl here is just noticing that she was really sleepy after school and would rather take a nap than playing with her friends. The next period is the period of invasion. This is a variable period during which the microbe multiplies in high numbers, and this causes the severest symptoms. Here the patient thinks they're gonna die. The last stage is called the convalescent period. This is the period of recovery with a decline of symptoms. You can see here that the patient is beginning to feel better. Okay, honey. Smooth.